Although there's only been one previous hung parliament in the past 100 years of federal politics, the states and territories are very familiar with the syndrome. Former New South Wales Liberal, Liberal Premier Nick Greiner in 1991, former Victorian Labor Premier Steve Brax in 1999, both successfully negotiated their way into minority government and they join me now, Steve Brax from Melbourne and Nick Greiner from Sydney. Uh, to you both, I just wonder what the hardest aspects of your negotiations with the independents were at the time and can you isolate one thing above all that got them to support you as the minority government? Nick Greiner? I hate to sound trite, but I think it was, uh, it was trust. I mean, in my case, originally, Tony Windsor, in fact, had the balance of power. The other independents weren't needed. And uh, I think in that case, it was pretty clear where the political momentum was. Uh, the Liberals had got 52 or 53% of the two-party vote. And so I think there was an element of trust and an element of, uh, of momentum. I think in this case, frankly, that's probably missing on both sides. So it wasn't, it wasn't an issue of what you were able to offer. For him. No, uh, I think we ended up having some discussion about uh, capital works in the Tamworth electorate. And, uh, I think there were some I, bus contracts. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, he got some of what he asked for. Uh, subsequently, of course, in uh, that term of government, the thing changed and there were uh, three independents with balance of power. And uh, then we, uh, their main concern was to ensure they got some reforms in the running of Parliament. And I think that, frankly, uh, uh, added some value in terms of uh, improving the nature of the New South Wales Parliament, which still exists today. Well, I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But, Steve Brax, can you think of one thing above all that got you and Labor across the line with those independents in Victoria in '99? Well, it was actually scary in a way, um, Kerry, because the, the situation was roughly equivalent to what we're seeing now. We had three independents. They're all country independents. We had one less seat than the, uh, the Liberal National Party at the time. We had 42, they had 43. We had to wait. Um, I had to say this, but we had to wait for at least a month. So it was about a month's wait until... Uh, we had a final outcome, and every day there seemed to be something different. Uh, one comment might be magnified into a large issue. Uh, there was vote counts. We had the seat of Geelong, ironically. Um, you can see Karangamite is near Geelong. It's very close. But the seat of Geelong came in by 16 votes. If those 16 votes didn't come in, we wouldn't have been talking about minority government. So the, the actual wait was a frustrating thing for a for us as a major party, and I'm sure it is for Julie Gillard and Tony Abbott. But, but I agree with Nick. Um, I think it was about trust. trust but, but the, the question is how was, you won yeah. the trust. The question is how did, yeah. how did you win the trust? Well, I think it's, it's, it's this in a way. It's the policies that you had before the election itself. Anyone can change their policies during a negotiating period. For example, um, Craig Ingram, who was in the Gippsland area, we had a policy to restore flows to the Snowy River before we knew about Craig Ingram. So we had a policy there. The Liberals, in this case, tried to change their policy during the negotiating period. And, of course, you know... People aren't born yesterday. That was seen through. So I suspect there'd be something like that around the, the broadband system, that if the Liberals suddenly change their policy, it will probably be counterproductive for them and work significantly against them in this, this process. Now, presumably, you have to draw some kind of a line beyond which you don't go, that you can't responsibly go. You can't just be sort of open-ended and just keep going and going until you get them across the line. Well, no, you can't have a salami slicing exercise where you just keep, uh, p keep cutting. I'm sure that's right. On the other hand, I don't think you can start with a totally inflexible position because, frankly, uh, this is all uncharted territory. I mean, it happens every so many years in state parliaments. But uh, the, the truth is, this is total serendipity and uh, these fellows, the three of them, have been, uh, as I put it, hit in the backside by a rainbow. I mean, they've been very lucky. They have a huge amount of power and they haven't been preparing for it. And the the, uh, the institutions aren't really prepared for it either. So there aren't any easy rules, I think, as to where you draw the line. Uh, I think it is more... It's a normal negotiation, but there's a lot of intuition and a lot of, uh, well, almost psychology, Kerry. I don't think it's a scientific exercise. What, what do you think of the current range of requests, uh, Steve Brax, particularly asking both leaders to guarantee they'll run a full three years? I'm not surprised. This has been a, 
a constant claim of independent members of parliament around the country. In fact, the reason that we have um, fixed four-year terms in Victoria, and I think it's the and same, in New South Wales. Nick, with, um, mm. with you in New South Wales, was largely because of the request by the independents, uh, fixed four-year terms, proportional representation in the upper house, um, a much more democratic and open parliament with question times answered more succinctly, uh, uh, independents able to bring up a, uh, a private member's bill and have it dealt with and debated. All those things sound very familiar. And I'm, I'm not surprised that parliamentary democracy is really where a lot of this matter is settled because, in a sense, you know, we have political parties. The independents don't. Their forum is the parliament. And so access to proper and appropriate support in the parliament, getting their voice heard, is always going to be the issue. Well, in New South Wales, Nick Reiner, right now, I don't think too many voters would be thinking either you or that, or those independents for the fixed term. And, and I wonder, you know, when you talk about the, those positive reforms for the way Parliament was run, uh, how effective were they in the end when you look at the state of the government in New South Wales today and how much on the nose it is with the public? Well, I don't think uh, the reason for them being on the nose is the fixed terms. The truth is the people voted them in uh, f uh, three and a half years ago uh, and uh, they wouldn't be voting themselves out even under a, a different form of, uh, of parliament. So I don't think that's really true. Look, I, I agree with Steve. I think actually a lot of that stuff, uh, which is naturally resisted by the political parties because it doesn't sit easily with, with their self-concept, in fact, has probably on balance been good. I'm not sure every initiative's turned out 100% right, but uh, I think if the independent and the federal independents now confine themselves to that sort of issue, I think that's a legitimate area of focus for people who happen to have ended up in this position. I frankly think that's a lot more legitimate than trying to write the defence policy or the trade policy or, you know, things that clearly don't have anything to do with independence as such or with their own personal election campaigns. Do you think it's a reasonable request to ask both parties to submit their, uh, their costings and the assumptions of those costings to Treasury and Finance? Steve Brex? Uh, yes, I, I do. And I don't think it's that hard. It's really a discovery process so that they have better information. And in a sense, it doesn't matter now. The election's over, so it really doesn't have any uh, electoral import anymore. So, um, and the reality is that, I mean, we, we all know how government works. Um, uh, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Department of Treasury, the, the Finance Department would all be doing this work ready for an incoming government. They'd have their red books, they'd have their blue books. They would have costed already the Liberal and National Party policies as well as the Labor policies because they have to. And so they'd have all that detail ready. And it's not going to be that hard to provide it. So I'm, I'm actually surprised at the tactic of uh, Tony Abbott. I'm not sure what he's doing there. My guess is he'll back down and he'll probably back down in a couple of days because it doesn't seem to be a sound position that he's taking and he probably hasn't got that much to fear in some ways. Okay. Yeah, look, I think I, I agree with that. I don't uh, think that's objectionable. I do think they're getting a bit uh, beyond the pale when they're talking about getting briefings, a sort of whole-of-government briefings which would cover defence and foreign affairs. You think it's going to their heads a bit? Well, you, you, you do get the impression that there might be some uh, delusions of grandeur. I mean, they are in a position to determine the next government and the way the parliament works. There's no doubt about that. One hopes they don't really believe they're in a position to actually run the government, make all the decisions, because well, frankly... Well, they say not. But, uh, uh, well, that doesn't work in practice. I mean, if you stick to things that you've actually got a personal agenda about, which you've been elected on, or which go to the role of independence and the functioning of the parliament, I think that's perfectly legitimate legitimate and probably a good thing. But going beyond that, frankly, is really scary and scary to business. And uh, I was in New Zealand today, Kerry, and people there saying, what's really going on there? Well, it's a few people in Australia are asking <laughs> the same question. I'm sure. But uh, just tell me this, both of you, how much of your time in the term of minority government was consumed by looking after the independents? Well, well Kerry, quite a bit. Um, I used to meet with the three independents on the first sitting day of every parliament. I'd go through the legislation, what was coming up, what was proposed. I'd uh, discover if they needed further briefings. I'd open up the executive, the government, to, to them to assist with briefings or support. They'd always have issues during the parliamentary sitting. And I, could, I had to deal with those personally. And often um, outside that, I'd be in, in touch every couple of weeks. So in some respects they became like a caucus or your party room. They were a second party room. Just what and you they, need. 
I just want you to know. But, 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 but could I say this, and I'm not sure if Nick uh, would support this, but they can also be a moderating influence. I, I don't think the first term that we had in 1999 for the three years was a bad government. In fact, it was a very good government. We got a record majority subsequently. And they had a moderating influence on government. We had to explain legislation better. We had to articulate it more precisely. And we had to persuade and argue. And that wasn't a bad thing. And I think, um, I think whoever gets in will find that stability will be something that will come. I mean, we'll be back here in two months if there is an agreement and we'll wonder what all the fuss was about because once a matter is secured, once supply and no confidence motions are supported, then the government will get on for its business as if it had a majority, and that's certainly what we did. OK. Nick Ryland? Oh, Kerry, I think I made a mistake. I didn't spend as much personal time. I delegated it to uh, the Leader of the House. I think that was a mistake in retrospect. Uh, I probably should have spent more personal time uh, on it. Um, I was more resistant, I guess I still am, uh, to the independence uh, getting out, getting sort of a complete 100% oversight of the government. Uh, uh, the truth is they don't have the capacity, the resources, the, uh, it's not part of their mandate in any sense. So I was more resistant to the notion of... Uh, if you like, handing the entirety of the government over. But certainly in retrospect, I think I should have spent more personal time uh, involved because at the end of the day, it had a real impact on the quality of the government. Just very quickly, sort of one or two word answers from both of you. Are you both, sure. con are you both convinced that there will be a resolution that we will not find ourselves going back to, uh, to an election because there could not be an agreement with one side or the other? Just quickly. I yes, I'm almost that... certain there will be a resolution. Yeah, I agree with that. OK, on that note, we'll finish it. Nick Greiner and Steve Brax, thanks for talking with us. Thank you.